Hey everyone, Fuseman coming at ya, and today I hope you're super excited to be playing around with Snapchat's Lens Studio. Now before we dive into the actual tutorial, I want to mention that there's a ton in Lens Studio to actually cover, so this video is specifically just going to be kind of a hello world bootstrapping tutorial type of video, and we'll play a little bit with the interface, a little bit with coding. But if there's anything specific you want me to cover, definitely leave a comment below, and maybe we'll try to make this a series, so just let me know in the comments, that'll be super helpful. So let's take a look at the website really quick. So first off is the intro. You can see here is just what an example application would look like. There's a challenges section, which is accepting a bunch of different submissions. By the time this video actually goes out, it'll probably be way too close to that deadline, but you can tell that Snapchat's actually kind of interested in curating a lot of content. You have guides, which are extremely important for actually getting started with Snapchat. This is how I got started, and it's pretty much one of the very few resources that are actually out there, so definitely take advantage of that. You have templates, which are also a huge resource. They help you bootstrap really quickly, and definitely we'll be diving into how to use one of these. And last but not least, you have the API. And just kind of looking at the classes, you can tell that there's a ton that's actually going into this uh, Lens Studio project and there's just so many different classes to play around with and I'm really excited to be playing around with all of them today. So with that out of the way, let's kind of just dive into the actual interface of Lens Studio. Here I have Lens Studio open. If you haven't downloaded it, I'll leave a link in the description below so you can actually go ahead and download it and then you should get something that looks similar to this. Uh, since I've been playing around with Lens Studio a little bit, you'll see I have a recent project but what should actually happen if you're opening it up for the first time is you should see these templates. Now these templates, like I mentioned in the intro, they're all basically here to help you get bootstrapped and getting you ready to go. So what we're going to be playing around with today is this interactive tap. So go ahead and double click that. That'll go ahead and load up your project and you'll see it right here. So your interface might look a little different from mine. I've kind of gone ahead and customized it. I think the core difference might be this preview will be located over here, uh, docked a little higher. Now, the, the thing about this, if you're familiar with Unity or Unreal, a lot of these windows are easily movable. Like as you saw what I, what I could do with the preview, I can just kind of drag, move this around. I can dock it next to the inspector. I can do a bunch of different things. So that's what's going on right here. Now, here's your scene view. So I can right click to move around our elephant right here. If you have a wheel on your mouse, you can go ahead and zoom in. I'm not sure how you would do that without that though. And uh, if you left click, you can select anything pretty much within your scene. So that's just kind of basic navigation that's going on right here. Down here, you'll see that we have a logger and that basically, if you have any scripts and you do a print function, that will go ahead and put all of the logs into the logger right here. Last but not least, you have your resources and this is what will be saved on your file system. So much like Unity's project assets view, that's exactly what resources is. And you have objects, which is equivalent to like a hierarchy. So you can see here, we can see a bunch of different objects that are nested within other objects. So what, if you're familiar with graphics, then that hopefully makes sense. It allows you to basically, nesting allows you to move the parent and then move anything underneath it in the same way. So high level, that's kind of the overall infrastructure that we're playing with. You can see here we've got project info. So if you want to change your icon, uh, any of this stuff, that's super important to specifically playing with um, what your app looks like to the end user. And one thing to note here is this thing right here that says the max allowed lens size is four megabytes. And that's actually a really important number. A lens studio tries to optimize your projects. Actually, if you go to file, you'll see that there's an optimized project here, which will basically take whatever in is in here and try to reduce the number of megabytes. Not always perfect, especially if you're playing with high textures and whatnot. So there are, there are a few suggestions I have. One. Uh, make sure that your audio is in mono and you compress it as much as you can using MP3. And two, make sure your textures are 
either uh, 1024 by 1024 or 512 by 512. Those should keep it, the file size on your textures fairly small. You probably also don't want to play with a lot of different textures such as me metallic maps and normal maps and all that stuff because you're constrained to, to 4 megabytes. You might be able to get away with it on like really small objects, but high level, that's kind of what you're looking at. You're, you're pretty constrained with 4 megabytes. So, And I think th there's a valid reason in that you don't want your end user downloading a lot. So that's that's kind of what we're playing with here. So everything you're seeing in the scene, it if you go to your project info view, you'll, you'll know what that value is. In this case, it, this template starts with 1.77 megabytes. Uh, you also have the ability to prompt the user with a tap and you can change your, your lens type. So that's kind of what this overall interface looks like. Now let's play with the actual template we downloaded, which was the interactive tab. What that does is allows us to click on our elephant and allows it to play an animation. We can trigger pretty much anything to happen on a tap, but in this case, it's just playing an animation. So that's cool. Uh, this one also has the ability, if you are dragging around on your scene, you'll be able to move it anywhere. Also, whenever you're playing this within Snapchat itself, you'll be able to use double fingers to increase the scale or rotate it. So that's what's going on with your preview. Super valuable. One thing to note here is whatever happens in the preview does not impact the scene view. And in fact, you won't see any of the changes that happen in the preview happening in the scene view. This can get a little confusing, but uh, it's there for a reason, which is basically to make sure that you don't accidentally do things in code that impact your actual project. So very important to keep in mind when you're actually trying to debug everything. And uh, the last thing I should mention, and you should probably just follow the guide on Snapchat's uh, documentation for this, is pairing your device. This allows you to go ahead and take your project, put it on your phone to actually test it out. And it should work on iOS and Android. I haven't tried iOS but I know Android works for sure. So there you have that. That's the interface in a nutshell. It's definitely, as I said, a ton here to talk about. So what we're gonna do is we'll take our little elephant here and let's write a simple script to just rotate him in a round in a circle. So to start, let's go ahead and in our resources, go and add a script. It'll kind of add itself kind of randomly anywhere. Let's just go ahead and drag it kind of outside, just like that. So it's kind of not nested within <laughs> any folder. Go ahead and rename it by just right clicking on it. And let's just say it's called the rotate function. So what we wanna do with this script is basically just have our elephant here just go rotating around in 360 degrees. Let's go ahead and open it up. And if you set up an, an external editor, sometimes like WordPad, sometimes in this case, I'm using Sublime, It'll go ahead and open up your script in this editor. For our purposes here, just in case you don't have that set up, I'm just gonna go and close Sublime. And the way you would edit normally is you have this little script asset here that can be used to write code. This is gonna be in JavaScript, so it's the same type of code that's used for web dev. And if you're not familiar with it, it's actually pretty easy to pick up. Uh, really, all you need to do is just go, go on the web, you'll find a few resources. And if you're familiar with coding already, it should be pretty straightforward. So what we're gonna do, as I said, just have this thing rotate. So the way we're gonna do this is first, we're gonna create a variable that keeps track of whatever the current time is, uh, divide that by 360 and multiply that by some speed value to get our current rotation. What the script is gonna be do doing is being called every single time we want to draw our scene. And during that time, we want to have a few set of variables that actually make sure that we're drawing the right rotation values. So for this, what I'm going to do is call this var new rotation equals get time. Now what game get time is, and let me go ahead and pull up the docs here and let's close this global methods. So the global methods are things that are accessible by any script at any given time, hence the name global. And you can see here, here are the options. What we're gonna be using is this one, get time, which gets the time in seconds since the lens was started. What, what that means is basically whenever a user goes and selects your lens, that's when get time is set to zero and it keeps counting up as long as the user continues to use your lens. So super valuable as far as getting 
a time value that we can use to change our animation over a set amount of time. So we'll be using that. I'm going to divide that by 360. And as you might be able to guess, that's because of we want to use this as a angle for how the elephant should be rotated. For now, I'm going to go ahead and multiply this by the kind of random number 100 just to see this actually work. So that's our new rotation. Next, what we've got to do is get access to our transform. Our transform is what allows us to actually change the positions, rotations, and scales of our object. So we need to get access to that within our script. So to do that, what I'm going to do is get the transform. And what we're going to be typing is script. And the script is another variable that's accessible across all your scripts. And it's unique to your specific script. You have a few methods that you can use to access it. And in this specific case, what we're going to do is get the scene object. The scene object is pretty much any of these. Specifically, what we're saying is we're a script. We're going to get the scene object that we're attached to. And then what we're going to do is get that transform. So what we've done here is we've just gotten access to our transform and save that within our variable trans. Last but not least, what we're going to go ahead and do is trans.setLocalRotation. And depending on where your game object is, you could probably also set the global rotation. But I'm just going to set that. And I'm going to do that from quat. So this is a shorthand for a quaternion. And quat from Euler. So Eulers are a different way of representing rotations. And what we're going to say is a, just pass it in three numbers, which represent a vector. And Eulers are kind of represented in vectors. Quaternions are a good math way to actually represent our rotations. So let's go zero, new rotation, zero. And let's make sure that all the things are spelled right. Looks good to me. Let's go ahead, hit apply changes. Now, of course, nothing's going to happen because what we need to do is go back into our objects, click on our elephant here. You can see that there's an animation that's already playing, which makes sense. Let's go to add object script. And then let's go and add our rotate script. All right. So you can see that something happened, but it's not happening all the time. And in fact, if I actually go back to our, our rotate script right here, if I hit apply changes, you'll see that it's kind of uh, random as far as when it actually chooses the rotation. The reason for that is because our rotate script is assigned to the event initialized. Now, if you want some good reading on what's actually happening with these events, I recommend checking out this page on script events. It's a really great introduction as far as when are the events called, what they do, and what's kind of passed into you. And you've got some example code here at the bottom. Uh, as far as these guides, most of the example code is at the bottom, so you're gonna have to scroll down a bit if you want to find it. That's something that I messed up when I was trying to figure it out. So here's some example event code. So definitely recommend checking this out to learn a little more. But for now, what we need to do is we want to change this to frame updated. Now you can see our elephants kind of rotating a bit slowly, not not terribly slowly, but a bit slowly. And of course, if we wanted to change that, what we need to do is go back to our rotate script, change this 100. What I'm going to do is show you how you can actually change that from within your object kind of dynamically a little bit. So let's go ahead and make some space here. What I'm going to type is a comment at input float speed. What this is is just a variable for a float called speed that we're going to be able to access from within our objects panel. I'm going to instead replace this with script.speed. What that does is gets our scripts access to the, the variable speed. And if we go back here, you can now see that our speed is set to zero. And in fact, because of that, our elephant has stopped moving. We can set it back to 100. And now it's moving, moving again. And if I set it to 1000, now see it's moving a lot faster. So you can now dynamically change this really easily without having to recompile your code. So very nice little touch. And I should also show you that our jump works just as well as the rotation, just because of the way this is set up. So <laughs> if you want a little quick, little fun, little demo to show off to people, this is probably it. You can probably add a ton more to it, but I think this is a good place to stop this tutorial. Again, let me know if you have any questions in the comments below. Uh, this was a lot of fun to do. And if there's any specific tutorials on Lens Studio that you want to see, definitely let me know. And I'm excited to play around with this a lot more. I think Snapchat's Lens Studio is a great tool. They're high level, I think, 
all of the positions are in place. There, there's some developer experience things that could be made better, but as as it is, it's already pretty amazing. So hope you enjoyed this. If you did, make sure to like that button and share this with a friend because that helps us out a ton. And if you aren't, definitely make sure to stay subscribed for a bunch of other videos that may be coming out in the future, uh, specifically on Lens Studio. Thanks so much for watching this and hope it was helpful. This has been Fuse Man, and I'll see you next time.